I'm Tandi Buane from the School of Public Health, UWC. Today I'm going to discuss with you the steps in conducting monitoring and evaluation activities. If you are employed as a program manager and you are tasked with a job of conducting monitoring activities, you have to start somewhere. And the first step you have to do is to review existing information related to the project. That is step number one. Why do you do that? This will help you to determine what the problem led to the introduction of the program and whether the program has been previously monitored or not. So if you are new in the program, you need to familiarize yourself with what problems led to the development of this program. So then reviewing the existing information will help you will give you that information. The next step, you have to develop or review your goals and objectives. If the goals and objectives were there but were not properly developed, you might have to correct them, go over them and make sure that they are appropriate. But if they are okay, then you just review them, just to find out what were the goals. For example, you may have a goal like this, to reduce the number of hospital deaths due to severe malnutrition, or to improve the hospital management of severely malnourished children. You will notice that a goal is very, very broad. It's not specific, it's not measurable. You just have to bear that in mind when we come to goals and objectives. The objectives, on the other hand, are specific. These are the examples. To increase the number of severely malnourished children who are fed three hourly day and night during hospital admission in Holy Cross District Hospital from 30 to 100% by the end of 2009. <coughs> this is a smart objective. It's smart in such a way that it is specific. If you send me to go and look for children, I am going to go to Holy Cross Hospital, so it's giving you a place where to go, and you are looking for severely malnourished children who are fed three hourly, day and night, while they are admitted in hospital. And it's measurable in such a way that you want to increase it from 30 to 100%. And it's time bound to 009. We spoke about smart objective. So this is a specific or a smart objective. Another example of an objective is to increase the number of severely malnourished children with moderate weight gain. And you have to define what is moderate weight gain so that everybody is in the same level of understanding. So in this case, moderate weight gain is five to 10 grams per kilogram body weight. This is specific enough so that anybody who wants to determine if children are gaining weight or not, or moderate weight gain, they will know exactly what you mean. That is per week time bound in Holy Cross District Hospital by the end of 2009. That is time bound. The next step then, <coughs> you have to identify the program components. The program components include inputs. Inputs are all the resources that go into developing the program. That is at the onset of the or startup phase of the program and during the program implementation phase. This is to enable the program to achieve its objective. For example, Inputs include the number of qualification or qualified personnel, the financial resources, the institutional setup, the timing, etc. All these things must be designed to address the problem. This is very, very important. You cannot run the program without the inputs. You really need inputs. You need trained or qualified people to be able to implement your project. You need finances, you need cars, you need 
you need a structure, you need a room. If you have to counsel people, you have to have a structure where people are going to be go for counseling, privacy, or if you are going to give lectures, you need equipment that are needed for giving lectures. So this is very, very important, the input. So you have to identify what is it that you have in the project or what is needed so that when you come to monitoring, you go back and monitor those inputs. The next component of a program is outputs. These are all goods or services delivered to the target group or population by the program. The inputs are transformed into outputs during the implementation of the program. Very, very important to note that the quantity and the quality of the outputs are important. The example of the outputs, it's counseling session because you are delivering the service to people number of condoms distributed, and number of awareness campaigns conducted. So whatever you deliver during the program implementation is regarded as an output, and it's counted, of course. The outcome are changes in behavior or practices as a result of your program implementation implementation or activities. Whatever you implement, you expect something to change. You expect the behavior of the people you are dealing with to change. If the outcomes are of the right quantity and quality, outputs should produce outcome. For example, if a campaign for increasing awareness about voluntary counseling and testing, for example, are reaching the right people, and are delivering the correct message in the correct language, there should be an increase in the number of people reporting for voluntary counseling and testing at the clinic or at the health facility. So the change in the behavior and practices of the population or of the community are the outcomes of the program. The outcomes are expected to influence the problem as defined in the beginning of the program. For example, in the problem, you may find that there is a decrease or people are not coming for testing and yet the prevalence rate is very, very high for HIV. And you come up with a goal that you want to increase the number of people who are coming for, uh, for counseling and testing. And then you have the awareness campaign as your input. You go to the community, you deliver messages, that is your, your outputs, and you expect the outcome to change, to increase the number of people who are coming to the health facility to be tested and go through counseling. The impacts is another component of the program. These are the effects of the program on beneficiaries. The change in the problem is the impact of the program on the beneficiaries or client. We want to reduce, for example, the measure goal will be to reduce the death or the burden associated with HIV. That will be the impact. That's what we are going to be looking at the end. Or we want to reduce the number of children who are dying during hospital admission. That is uh, reducing case fatality rate. That will be the impact, at the, the impact at the end because that is what it has got on there beneficiaries, reducing the problem. Processes is also an important component of the program. It, processes include different activities, that is processes, aimed at achieving the objective or realizing the results. The processes show project implementation, implementing stage, and not only indicate what activity has been carried out, but also how well the activities was carried out. For example, if you record, the re when the records reflect a newly admitted malnourished child, finish all the feeds, we would like want to know further if the child ate eagerly or reluctantly, whether he finished his feed at once, or they had to be re-offered. 
which means that how well that activity is done. We're not interested that the child finish, but we need to know so as to be able to make decision for further feeding treatment. So as I've said, this will assist in making decision about the condition of the child and future feeding plan. This is very important because these children, when they come in, they don't have appetite, they don't eat well, but one of the signs of recovery is the return of appetite. Those who have cared for uh, severely malnourished children will know that. Even yourself, when you are sick, you don't feel like eating, but once you start recovering, the sign that you are recovering, the appetite comes back. So this is very, very important. So step number three, you have to determine activities that are needed to attain the objectives. Once the program objectives are clearly identified, that is the SMART uh, objectives, the next step includes determining what activities are needed in order to achieve program objective. These activities will determine what needs to be monitored. So you take the objectives, you put them down, you sit with other stakeholders, and you list all the activities. If you want to increase the number of people coming for HIV testing, you say what activities are needed. Is it the campaign? What do you do? Is it education of the people who are going to give education and all those things? So you have to do that. Then the next thing, you have to decide on the questions that need to be answered by the program. This is very, very important because when you evaluate, you want some questions answered. For example, activities that you have uh, just put down will should sh also shed light on some of the monitoring and evaluation questions. This question in turn should define the information which the monitoring and evaluation activities seek to collect. You'll collect that information based on the questions that you're answering. And they should also guide the development of data collection instrument. Because when you go and collect data, you also need to develop your question. So these activities, as well as the question that you're trying to answer, will help you to determine what information to collect. Some of the examples of the questions that can be answered by the program evaluation or monitoring is as follows. Is the program effecting, effective in reducing the number of nurses who record feeds without actually feeding the children? If you, for example, you find that that lack of knowledge is a problem in the nurses who are caring for children who are severely malnourished children, and then you decide to give them health class lectures to educate them. Then you have to go ask yourself, is this program really effective or do I need something else? And then if it's not effective, if it's not answering what you think you want to be answered, then you have to plan again and put more objective and more resources. Another question, is the program effective in increasing the number of children who are fed three hours a day and night during hospital admission? All these things are related to activities that are being carried out by the people who are trained and the people who are taking care of these children. Is the program effective in increasing the number of severely malnourished, malnourished children with moderate weight gain? That is the 5 to 10 grams per kilogram weight gain per week. So whatever you're putting into place, you need to have these questions so that by the time you evaluate, you come back, you say, is this program really, really e effective or we need to put something else in addition to what we have put? The next step, step number five, you have to develop monitoring and evaluation objective. Monitoring and evaluation objective are derived from the program objectives as well as the activity of achieving this objective. As we have said, you have the goals. From the goals, you derive your op smart objectives, and then you can also derive your monitoring and evaluation objective from the program objective. This is an example of a table that I've just put together. And the first column, you have your goal. The second column, you have your program objective. And then the third column, you have your monitoring objective. And lastly, the evaluation objective. All these should speak to each other. Let's look at the goal. 
the goal states to improve the nutrition, nutritional status of children. Now, you take that goal, you develop your objective. Your objective should be smart. That is, it's measurable. It really should be realistic, measurable, time-bound, as we have mentioned earlier. So the objective, it says, to increase the percentage of children under the age of 24 months who are fed three meals and two snacks per day from 20% to 80% in Mount Frey district by the year three of the program. This is a smart objective in such a way that it is specific. It um, concentrates on the children aged 24 months and they are feeding fed three meals per day so anyone who comes and looks at this objective will say all the children the age of 24 months should be given three meals and two snacks per day. And you want to increase that. And you think that, okay, maybe you collected information at baseline, that is at the beginning. You find that only 20% of the children were fed three meals and two snacks. And you want to increase it to 80%. That is a measurable. That's measurable. And specific, it's in Mount Fred District, and time-bound, it's by the year three of the program. Now, we have to, from that, we have to derive monitoring objective. And I assume that after that uh, program objective, you sit down and you break down the activities. Some of the activities, what, maybe to educate the mothers, maybe to make meals available, whatever activities. Then you come back and you say, okay, let me now have the monitoring objective. The monitoring objective should really speak to the program objective because it's going to help you to achieve those objectives. So it says to obtain the number of children who are less than 24 months, who are fed three meals and two snacks per day on a monthly basis. Let's say you're working at the clinic. You collected information this month. You find that amongst all the children who are coming, only 20% are fed three meals and two snacks. The next thing, the activity that we are going to do, you are either going to educate the mothers because you have to do the why is it happening. Find out from the mother. Is it the lack of uh, feeds? Is it the lack of uh, knowledge? Whatever, whatever might be leading to this problem. And then you start working on that. Increase the knowledge of mother or increase access by giving uh, uh, food packages to the children. So the following month when the mothers come, you are going to collect that information again. You find out from mother. How many meals is a mother feeding? Snacks. You, you don't just have to ask how many meals and how many snacks. You say to the mother, tell me, what did you feed the child this morning? What time did you feed? And then, what else did you feed? Next feed, what did you give? Maybe 10 o'clock, did you give anything? The mother will tell you. You move uh, through the hours of the day. At 11, did you give anything? At 12, did you give anything? You sort of record what the mother is doing. From all, you're taking the information for the 24 hours. Then you're going to determine whether three meals and two snacks were given. So this number should increase if the mothers are given. Because we said monitoring, you conduct monitoring activities in order to take action. So if you find that there is a problem, you try and rectify the mistake with the mother. Either more education about the benefit of feeding the child or you give feed if the packages if the mother has got no feed. So you collect this information every month. So that will be a monitoring objective. It's just to obtain. Monitoring is very easy. You don't you don't explore in depth, but you just get the number because you want the number to increase. And then when you come to the evaluation, the evaluation objective should correspond to the program objective. It says to increase if there is, I'm sorry, to determine if there is an increase in the percent of children under 24 months who are fed three meals and two snacks per day. Because that side in the program objective you said to increase. Now you determine if there is an increase. And then we move on to the next objective, which are similar, written in a similar way, to increase the number of children who are less than 24 months, 
who are fed on energy-dense food from 10 to 80 percent in Mount Frey Health District by the year three of the program. In your, in your um, monitoring objective, you need to obtain monthly the number of children less than 24 months who are fed energy-dense food. And that needs to be defined or explained. Energy-dense food, it means sugary food, food with, such, with fat such as peanut butter and margarine. This is very important so that everybody knows we have got similar understanding what do you mean by energy dense food. Then in your evaluation objective, determine if there is an increase in the percent of children who are fed on energy dense food. So you go on and on depending on the objectives that you are working on. But to have a table like this is very, very useful because it helps you to go back and check if you are achieving what you wanted to achieve. The next step is selecting indicators. I'm going to have another lecture on because indicators are very important, but for now we're going to mention as one of the steps and go through, but later on we will deal with it separately. So once the program objectives are clearly stated and the activities that need to be carried out for the purpose of meeting the objectives are determined, the program components that are related to the program to be evaluated are listed. The next step is selecting indicators. What is the indicator? I'm sure all of you know we have been using this word, but we'll define this and indicate as, as a variable that measures an aspect of a program or project. An indicator is a measurable parameter that provides an overall summary of the situation. While objectives tell you what the project plans to achieve, indicators tell you how to measure and ascertain if the objectives are being achieved or not. So in other words, the indicator is just a marker. You go and you said, I want to increase the number of mothers who are breastfeeding every time the child cries or breastfeeding for six months, let me say. And your indicator then will tell you whether you're achieving what you want to do or not. So an indicator therefore informs the program manager of the outcome of the intervention. You put the intervention, educating the mother, encouraging them about breastfeeding, telling them the benefits of breastfeeding, but now are you achieving what you say you're achieving or not? You want to increase the mother who are exclusively breastfeeding for six months. If there is an increase in the mothers who are breastfeeding, exclusively breastfeeding for six months, that is an income. That in, it's an outcome because it's a change in behavior. So now that is what outcome has resulted from the intervention is very, very important. In this case, what cause outcome have resulted from the intervention is to improve the management of severe malnourished children. That is the program that we're talking about. Through the training of staff using the WHO guidelines and from the implementation of the WHO guidelines, all children who are admitted with severely malnourished children. So it means that all the children who are admitted with severely malnourished children should be treated according to the guidelines. And in order to do that, you have to take the nurses and you train them on the implementation of the guidelines. And one of the outcomes or the indicator will be to see the increase in the number of children who are severely malnourished children. When admitted, they are nest, nest according to the guidelines, WHO guidelines. So in simply word, an indicator is a marker. It can be compared to the road sign, which shows whether you're on the right road, how far you have traveled. Let's say you're going to Johannesburg. You look at the road mark, let's say it says Johannesburg. How far you have traveled, you know that you have to cover 200 kilometers, and it shows you that you have maybe traveled 150 and you are left with 50, whatever. And how far you still have to go in order to reach your destination. 
Indicators therefore show the progress and help to measure the change. The next step is decide on the method of data collection. There are several uh, methods that you may use to collect monitoring data. First of all, you may use observation. Observation of actual activities could be done. Those activities that are carried out in the course of the implementation of the program. Information collected through observation may include feeding time. You want to determine if children are fed three hours a day and night. The type and amount of feeds given, you may observe that. The feeding method used, whether they use nasogastric tube, whether they, uh, they use bottles, whatever the spoons and all those things. And you can also obje observe the attitude of staff during feeding times. Observation have an advantage because they give you first-hand information. When you observe, you'll see exactly what is happening. The disadvantage of uh, collecting information through observation is that people change behavior when they are observed. So to co overcome this shortcoming, you may have to spend time with people observed and to make them feel at ease. And then once they're at ease, you start collecting the information. There are many ways. At times, you have to train different people who are not involved in the project. Because if you are a program manager and you go to the water and make observation, definitely people will be tense and start changing behavior. But if you have got people who come in and sit in the water and just make observation, you'll get correct information. Just an example in the project that we're working with, we had a, a nurse's recording that all the children were given feet, all the children were given a malnar a, um, treatment for malnourished children, and they were nursed according to WHO, but the number of children dying did not decrease. So we trained uh, field workers, two research assistants, to go into the ward and sit in, and they communicated with the staff and they got used to them and surprisingly really some reported that even if an action was not taken have not taken place they will see that later on they find that it has been signed that the child has been fed or the child has been given treatment because just people get used to so you know observations are very very important but you just have to make sure that you do them properly in order to get the information that you need. And you don't have to have a, a checklist with you and showing people that you are ticking all the time because it makes people feel uncomfortable. Record review. You can also use record review, review of records, to obtain information that is recorded regarding the activities that has been performed already. For example, you may review record determine whether children were fed on time and type of feeds given, as well as whether the feeds were all taken or not by the children. Records may also be, review, be used to review information or statistics related to the outcome of the problem of the intervention. For example, the increase in the number for the number of nurses who are using WHO guidelines. The records have the advantage of having the data you require to perform your monitoring already at hand. But there are disadvantages. Disadvantage is that people record actions that they have not even performed. So that's a problem. They record that they fed children, and yet the ch children had not been fed. So the disadvantage of collecting data through records is that some information may be missing because it has never been recorded. Handwriting may be difficult to read, and the person who wrote the information might not be there to assist. Some activities may have been recorded even if they were not performed. So they are unreliable in a way. The next uh, method that you can use to collect monitoring activities or monitoring data is interviews. This involves oral or questioning of respondents 
either individually or as a group. It is suitable for use with illiterate people. However, it, permit, it also permits clarification. You can ask for clarification if you don't understand. In collecting monitoring data, interviews may be used to validate data that has been collected from the records. For example, you might interview the mothers about the number of times the child was fed and whether the child finished all the feeds or not. This information can be compared with the information recorded on the child's record. So you come, you find that everything is recorded, the child is fed, but you may ask the number. The danger is that if you are having the mothers in the ward and you are having nurses, mothers may be scared to tell you, may be afraid to tell you, or they will be yelled at by the nurses that they are sort of telling, they are spying. So that is a, a disadvantage. You can also use this different uh, method. You can use um, interviews of mother. Tell, I mean, you can use it in a way that you can tell them nurses that this is what I'm going to do. At times, I'll ask the mothers so that the people who are being monitored are aware of what's going to happen. So that when you ask them, they know what to expect. They know they are, they are expecting that. So it's better at times to use two methods in order to validate the other methods. You can also take a direct measurement. Direct measurement enable the evaluator to ascertain changes. For example, nutrition status as an outcome of the program intervention. A number of specific methods often employed in direct measurements of nutrition level include anthropometry, that is taking weight, age, weight for age, height for age, weight for height, and body mass index. Even blood pressure, you can collect those measurements. Rather than looking at the records only, you may review the records and you just validate by taking the measurements yourself. For example, when I visit the hospital, taking the weight of the children, I look at the records, what has been recorded, and you may take those children and put them in the scale and weigh them yourself so as to compare what has been recorded and what you actually get. Another method, another thing that may be used in direct measurements, biochemical indices, blood analysis, urine, and breast milk. Clinical signs of micronutrient deficiencies, goit and night blindness. Direct measurements can be influenced by precision practices. Periodic calibration of the scale is very, very important for anthropometric measurement. It's very necessary. Because if you keep on weighing children, you don't calibrate the scale, you might get wrong measurements. So there are things also that are important when you look at direct measurements. Facility auditing for available resources is one of the methods that you can use. It is important to know that the program implementation will not be successful without the resources needed to carry out necessary activities. Those are the inputs, very, very important. It is therefore important that auditing of available resources be part of monitoring activities. Human financial and material resources. You cannot run the project if there are no trained personnel, if there is a shortage of staff, if there are no finances, if there are no resources. Those things are very, very important and they need to be monitored. So the next step, once you know exactly what information you need to collect, you have to develop a monitoring tool. Monitoring activities are carried out in order to determine whether the activities aimed at achieving the objectives are carried out as planned and to determine if expected changes are occurring. So it's very, very simple. The questions that you ask when you develop the tool, usually it's yes or no. Was the action done yes or no? Is the resource available yes or no? It's very, very simple. Once you have a complicated question, it means that you are moved on to evaluation. So that is very, very important. You never tool, correct, simple, few questions. That is 
that is, that is going to help you to analyze because these questions need to be analyzed and give you information that is usable for your program implementation. Otherwise, it becomes too complicated. You collect information that you are not going to use. The tool, then it becomes redundant because whatever you have collected, you are going to put it in the shelf. So, yeah, just to summarize, we have just gone through the steps of uh, carrying out monitoring and evaluation. And it just goes back that you have to, first of all, review the existing information. What has been what has been monitored? Has it been monitored? What is the problem? And then from there, you go through your goals and objectives. And then from there, you go to developing your objectives, monitoring objectives. And then from there, you determine the activities that need to be carried out. And you move on to select your indicators and you develop the data collection tool. And then you go on, you collect the information that you need. And that's the <laughs>